Uh, all right. Welcome, everybody, to Perfect Love Worship Center's Zoom Wednesday night Bible study. Uh, we are going into lesson number four of our series on the parables of Jesus. Just want to remind everyone, uh, once again, mute yourselves right now and uh, and then be ready to unmute yourself when you are uh, called on to respond to a question or, or read a, a scripture verse. And uh, we will get uh, the most out of this lesson with the least amount of distraction. Amen. At this time, Sister Patty is graciously uh, agreed to uh, present uh, this lesson uh, that she has worked on. And we want the Lord and his spirit to take control and have its way in this place tonight. Uh, open our hearts and our minds to receive his word. Sister Patty, God bless you. Uh, you uh, take your liberty in the Lord. You have the calm. Well, thank you, Brother Alex. Um, I actually graciously thank you <laughs> for the honor to teach. And thank you, everybody, for being here tonight and uh, always being uh, hungry for the word of God. Amen. Amen. So we want to go right into our lesson tonight, which is one of our parables. Uh, this is lesson four in the parables of Jesus. Um, I hope everybody's enjoying learning about the parables. Um, does anybody want to volunteer and tell me what a parable is? I'm going to say a story that's easily relatable on many levels. Very good. That's a good explanation. That's a good yeah. answer. Thank you. Um, this is uh, definitely one of those series that uh, has a lot of different lessons. And the thing is, is most of the times we just read through the Bible and we read, you know, maybe Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and you don't think about how many parables there really are. So I find this series really interesting and in that God brought us in this direction. So the next uh, lesson is called Vacant Houses. How many of you have ever been in a vacant house? Me. <laughs> <laughs> I <Yeah>. have. <laughs> How about a dirty vacant house? Yeah, me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I don't I, I don't think I've ever been in one that was really bad, but I've heard stories. And uh, I know I have one next door to me. <laughs> yeah. But God's got that taken care of. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> He's so good. You know, I was mentioning today that lots of times, you know, you're in your home and you're praying, you know, we have our prayer time and our devotions and you don't ever stop to think, you know, you pray for your neighbors, you pray for the things around you, but you don't ever stop to think how it's really affecting your area. And I just think about next door and I'm like, thank you, Jesus, because you took care of that. Amen. So, um, but that's not what we're talking about tonight. But this is another parable, which we're going to get right into. So I need a volunteer to read from Matthew 12, 38 to 45. I'll read. Ready? Okay, Lori, thank you. Then some of the scribes and the Pharisees answered saying, teacher, we want to hear something from you. But he answered and said to them, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the son of man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nevia, Nineveh. Nineveh. Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah and indeed a greater than a greater than Jonah <clears throat> is here the queen of the south will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon and indeed a greater than Solomon is here. Amen. 
an unclean spirit returns. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places, he can rest and finds none. Then he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. So shall it be with this wicked generation. Amen. Thank you, Lori, for a beautiful reading. So I hope everybody got that because <laughs> yeah. that's the basis of, of this uh, lesson. Um, so Jesus had turned water into wine. I, I just need everybody to mute though, because I hear. Jesus had turned water into wine, healed the sick, raised the dead, cast out evil spirits, and performed astonishing miracles. Imagine how he must have felt when the scribes and Pharisees came to him, demanding yet another sign to prove his ministry. Can you imagine? Yeah. <laughs> it's like us going up to, you know, where God, you know, Alex, brother Alex lays hands on somebody and, you know, their arm grows or um, a tumor is removed and everybody goes, yeah, that was cool. That was great. Wow. Did you see that? That was amazing. And then you go to Alex the next Sunday and say, are you sure you're supposed to be here? Are you sure, <laughs> you know, are you sure you're the right man that God sent here? And that's exactly what they did to Jesus. They were always testing him and making him prove himself. So in his typical manner, he answered these skeptical Pharisees by teaching them in parables. I hate to say it, but they deserved it. <laughs> um, not that we, we don't always get what we deserve. Thank God. So Jesus looked beyond the grand robes and proud attitudes of the scribes and Pharisees and saw the needy persons inside. He saw their emptiness, the void in their hearts and knew that it was not soon filled with the righteousness of God. It would someday be filled with evil. Jesus began to relate to them the two short parables. I'm sorry, the, the two short uh, parables of the, the of the attitudes and scribes of the Pharisees, and he began to relate to them two short parables that revealed the true sign and authority of his ministry. So Jesus decided to honor what they were doing and show them and prove to him his ministry. That's pretty neat, right? He could have walked away and said, forget about you. <laughs> but no, he, he actually decided he was going to reveal to them the true sign and authority of his ministry. The parable of Jonah and the parable of the Queen of Sheba. Nineveh was more righteous than Jerusalem because the people of Nineveh repented at the preaching of Jonah. Everybody remembers that story, right? Where Jonah went to Nineveh and, well, actually God sent Jonah to Nineveh to, to tell the people to repent. And they actually repented, which I think shocked Jonah <laughs> because he, yeah. did, he really hated the Assyrians. He hated the people of, because they came and killed his father and, uh, and killed so many of his own people. So he hated them. And that's why he resisted going to Nineveh. But God made him still go. He doesn't take excuses. <laughs> yeah. Um, but Jerusalem, on the other hand, refused to repent at the preaching of someone who was even greater than Jonah. And the Queen of Sheba was more noble than Jerusalem because she recognized and acknowledged, acknowledged the wisdom of King Solomon. But Jerusalem refused to accept the wisdom of someone who was greater than Solomon. The Pharisees wanted undeniable, unquestionable, absolute evidence. 
but Jesus would not provide it because his will that we accept him by faith. Can everybody say amen to that? Amen. <laughs> it's God's will that we accept him by faith. Not because, not because we simply can't refuse him. God always, always gives us enough as evidence to sustain our faith, but never so much as to be absolutely infutable. He always demands us to accept him by faith. He says without faith, right? It's impossible to please him. So if we want to believe him, the evidence is sufficient. If we want to reject him, the evidence is always can always be disputed. In effect, Jesus was saying, was saying, I am your sign, right? I am your sign. I am your Jonah. I am your Solomon. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. The evidence of Jesus always demands a response. He does not allow indifferent neutrality or ambivalence or indecision. No one, not the Pharisees, not you or I or the President of the United States <laughs> or anyone can be neutral to Jesus. We are either for him or we are against him. Amen. Amen. Jesus was pushing the Pharisees to make up their minds, to make their decision. Would they accept him or would he or would they reject him? In order to press them into making a decision, decision, Jesus immediately began to relate another parable to them. The parable of the empty house. This parable tells the story of a man whose emptiness eventually resulted in his destruction. So sometimes you know, you could be have a house on the outside that looks beautiful on the inside, but it's empty, right? Totally different when you walk into an empty house as opposed to a full house. An unclean spirit was cleaned out of the man's heart. However, the man did not fill his heart with God's spirit, so his heart remained empty. The displaced spirit continued to roam about seeking a new dwelling place. And eventually it returned and found the house empty. Not only did the unclean spirit reoccupy the man's heart, but seven more evil spirits also joined him. Can everybody please mute because I'm getting some really high pitched. I just have to open this up so I can mute. Er there it is. Okay, I found the culprit. <laughs> um, so where was I? Okay, here. So not only did the unclean spirit reoccupy the man's heart, but seven more evil spirits also joined him. It's kind of weird, eerie, right? When you think about it. But this is the Lord speaking. The final state of the man was far worse than ever before. So what's the moral of the story? Well, we're going to find out. Because it's a parable, right? So God's going to give us an earthly story to give us some heavenly wisdom. You see, the Pharisees had cleaned up their lifestyle. They had swept out many evil actions and practices, but they had not yet been filled with righteousness. They had cleaned the house, but it was still empty. Jesus was teaching that the absence, I'm sorry, 
Jesus was, te was commending the Pharisees on the steps that they had taken to clean their house of their heart. But he was encouraging them to take the next step, be filled with righteousness. Sooner or later, the house, our, our, the house, our heart, okay, will be occupied. Whether they be by evil or by righteousness depends on our decisions. So yes, our decisions matter, the, matter a great deal indeed. You know, when you come to that fork in the road, take it. <laughs> That's what um, Yogi Berry used to say. Um, we all have to make decisions. We all have to make major decisions. I know a lot of us on this Bible study tonight are right now making major decisions, major choices. And it's imperative that you make the right choices. Maybe God's been dealing with you about something. Maybe he's been just dropping little you know, messages into your mind or into your heart. And it's easy to ignore. But that's the thing. You don't want to ignore, ignore his little messages. Because that's when you have to make the decision. Am I going to listen to God or am I going to ignore him? So, again, it's those little decisions. We, our, our righteousness depends upon our decisions. Sooner or later, the heart will be occupied, whether by evil or by righteousness, and that depends on our decisions. So scripture teaches us that you and I were designed and architecturally constructed to be the dwelling place of the spirit of God. So essentially, you can say you are a custom-built house for God. I think that's awesome. However, because of the sin in Adam and Eve, evil, deceit, and wickedness has occupied the hearts of mankind since the Garden of Eden. Would somebody please read Jeremiah 17, 9 through 10? I can read it for you, Sister Patty. Oh, thank you, Sister Sean. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, searches, search the heart. I try, I try the reins, even to give every man accordance to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. Jeremiah 17, 9, 10. Thank you, Sister Sean. And Luke 13, 3. Well, I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. You see, the house needs cleaning. Thank you, Brother Ed. Repentance and turning away from sinful lifestyle is a wonderful thing. How many of you have ever felt that wonderful thing about turning away from a sinful lifestyle? I think we could all remember that that time when we had to make that decision, right? It's a t it's a wonderful occasion. It's something you never forget. You never forget. And I uh, and I don't ever want to forget. I always want to remember where God brought me from. And as much as there's a lot of things I'd like to forget, that's one thing I want to remember. Repentance and turning away from a sin sinful lifestyle is Wonderful, but absolutely necessary. We must clean out the house. But after cleaning the house, we must make sure that the right occupant comes to take up residence. Jesus was pushing the Pharisees to open up and receive him. You see, there's Jesus right in their face. <laughs> so if the preacher gets right in your face, don't get mad at him. He was warning them that if they did not accept him into their hearts, they would soon be filled with the spirits of evil and unrighteousness. Jesus came to his chosen people in order to take up his rightful residence in the hearts that he himself had created. The response, however, was skepticism, disbelief, and suspicion. They wanted him to prove himself. 
Ultimately, they did not accept him because he would not come to them on their own terms. Would somebody please read John 11, 1 through eleven twelve? I got it. He came Thank unto you. he came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave the power to become the son sons of God, even to them that believe believe on his name. Thank you, Sister Hope. You're welcome. Because of their continued rejection, how many of you have ever felt rejection? I have. Some of us have felt serious rejection over and over and over. But I just want to encourage you today, when you go through times of rejection, when you feel that horrible feeling, you know, when you don't know which way to turn because you're feeling that form of rejection, remember Jesus suffered it way before you did. He was our example on how to handle rejection. What did he do? when people rejected him. Well, that's another Bible study. But we pretty much know he loved everybody, no matter what, right? So be, uh, Matthew 23, 38 says, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. Desolate, wasted, ruined, lonesome. Jesus then turned to the lowly and common people who received him gladly. The empty hearts of the disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. God made them his dwelling place. For the first time, God was dwelling not with man, but in man. Would somebody please read John 14, 17 through 18? Jesus said, the spirit of truth, he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. What a beautiful promise. Thank you, Sister Gina. I love that scripture. Praise God. He will not leave us comfortless, but he will come to us. He didn't say he would make us come to him, right? Praise God. Jesus then turned to the lowly and common people who received him gladly. Oh, here it is. As I already said, praise God. Then Jesus turned, I'm sorry. Then Jesus declared that human flesh is no match for the strongholds and principalities of darkness. And we can find that in Ephesians chapter 6. Satan and his demons are fallen angels. Angels are more powerful creatures than human beings. Has anyone on here ever encountered an angel or seen an angel? Anybody got an angel story? Yes, I've seen an angel. Yes. I see her every day. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> Well, I'm not one of those big and strong, powerful ones. That's for sure, if I am an angel. <laughs> but anyway, anybody anybody have a testimony of an angel? This is your chance to speak up. Give us a I great testimony. Sister test Patty. Oh, Sister Sean. Yes, thank you. I have. Uh, I can't remember. It was like quite a while ago. And uh, it was nighttime. And I was very troubled, beyond troubled. And in deep prayer, I guess, asking for help. and. Um, I saw a light in my room, a very small light, and it wasn't moving. So I wasn't a bug or a firefly or whatever it's called, <laughs> you know, to, and, um, and as soon as I saw it, I knew what it was and I felt relief. And then I blinked and it was gone. I mean, there was nothing in the room. The door, you know, was closed. There, there was nothing there. Praise so God. I felt my relief. Praise it God. Was that my prayer that someone was there with me. So I'm Praise thankful God. for that. Thank you, Jesus. Anybody? Thank you, Sister Sean. That's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Let's all remember that. That's a great little testimony. 
well, not little, it's a great testimony of an angel visitation to bring you peace and calm. Angels are ministering uh, spirits, I guess, or what's the scripture? Angels are ministering sent to the heirs of salvation. <laughs> I can't remember what that one word is. Do you know, Alex? See there? Okay. Oh, hello. I, I, I was I had to unmute myself. I forgot where where I was uh, muted. <laughs> yeah, angels are I can't remember that word. It's embarrassing. Oh, uh, a seraphim and um no no angels are blank uh to the heirs of salvation. I've never heard that before. Oh, okay. It doesn't ring a bell. Okay. Well, if I remember at the end, I'll share it. Yeah. Um, but I have a, a great, it wasn't my story, even though I do have an angel story, but I think this one is so neat. A friend of mine, and I might have shared this before, I had a sister who was uh, dying, literally. Her brother had called her up and said, you know, your sister's in the hospital dying. Uh, you better, you know, give her a call or something. And she really flippantly uh, thought to her, it was you know, because she had never heard from her sister. Her sister never called, never wrote, nothing. And in her mind, she had basically, for good or bad or for worse, had basically just, you know, forgotten about her sister. And now her brother's calling and saying, your sister is dying. And so she decided to pray. And when she prayed, she's like, God, just send an angel to her, you know, and she didn't pray, Lord, send your great angel to her, send your healing angel to her, send a mighty angel. She just said, Lord, send an angel. And she said, um, then when she talked to her sister, her sister said, yeah, um, some guy, you know, knocked on my door, a short guy. And he came in and he looked at me and he said, can I, can I pray for you? And she said, sure. And, and, uh, so he, he prayed for her and then he sat down and he talked to her a little bit and gave her like this little jar of sand that was glowing. Wow. Yeah. And he said, uh, this is sand from the promised land from cool. Israel. And he goes, my name is Gabriel. No and, way. Then he, and then he left. Right. And so another guy came in and, uh, she, and he was the chaplain, you know, from the hospital. And he, she sa he said, can I give you prayer? Can I pray for you? And she goes, oh, she goes, uh, somebody from your, you, you know, from your office already came. You know, he was a short guy. And he said his name is Gabriel. <laughs> she, still <laughs> <didn't>, <laughs> she still didn't know uh, what it all meant, but she was just repeating it, you know. And, uh, and so uh, she got healed. She got healed. She was dying. And she got healed. I don't know all the details, but she was telling her sister, you know, I got healed. I'm going to be going home. And uh, her sister's like, do you know who that was? <laughs> <laughs> and she she said and then she felt bad because, you know, her the, the sister that prayed felt badly because she took it so flippantly, you know. But meanwhile, God took it seriously. He cared about this woman as as much as she might have been upset with her and uh so she got healed and she got out and then her sister said well i gotta go talk to her about baptism and you know and getting filled with the spirit if god because i remember we were on a prayer walk and we're all telling her well you got to go pray for her you know to get saved and but her sister lived in in the northern woods of california so she finally did get there and she uh took her to, uh, her sister agreed to get baptized. She took her to a hotel pool and they accommodated her. But now they don't do that anymore. Mm. But I remember when we were looking, remember Alex to get somebody baptized and the hotel wanted to charge us for it. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, they don't even allow you to do it. I don't yeah. think they allow you. So she baptized her sister in the pool. And, uh, I guess a couple of brethren from a local church or something came and helped her. And, uh, and then she brought her another time to a church service and she got filled with the Holy ghost. Awesome. So praise God. You never know. 
but it yeah. was all because of a prayer and an angel, <laughs> Gabriel. So back to the angels. So Satan and his demons were actually fallen angels. But angels, mind you, are more powerful creatures than human beings. By ourselves, we are helpless against these rebellious evil forces. Or as, the, as they fight against us and influence us for evil. But that's well, all right. Angels, I'm sorry, angels have the strength of 10,000 men. Ah, uh, is that in the Bible? Yes. Okay. Well, uh, Sister Patricia, would you, I mean, I'm looking at my own name. That's okay. <laughs> Um, Human flesh is no match for the strongholds of principalities of darkness. <laughs> no, no, no. Would you, uh, would you, Patrice, look up where that is in the Bible so we could? Okay, I'll try. Okay, thank you. My phone doesn't like me doing a lot of things at the same time. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. I don't want to lose you. <laughs> okay. All right. We could do it later. Okay. Uh, would somebody please read Ephesians six twelve? Um, is it on the screen? Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's in the picture. I see it. See the picture? For I, I know it by heart, so I could just say it. But, um, okay. Can you say it backwards? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> we wrestle I next. challenge you. <laughs> um, places high in the wickedness, spiritual. No, I'm just kidding. Um, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against... <laughs> principalities against powers against the rulers of darkness of the world against spiritual wickedness in high places <laughs> thank you sister nicole you're welcome <laughs> this is why man in the parable or this parable was powerless to resist the unclean spirit when it returned to his house does everybody remember that in the beginning mm -hmm. the scripture that uh, Lori read he did not have enough power to keep the unclean spirit out. So this is why we can't stop sinning by our own power alone. And this is why we can't control our flesh by our own power alone. And this is why we can't live a truly clean life by our own power alone. And remember I, this, it says, human flesh is no match for the strongholds and principalities of darkness. That's why we have to be filled with the Spirit. Jesus said, without me, in John 15, 5, you can do nothing. Would somebody please read? I actually was thinking of this scripture today. And when I was reading through the lesson and saw this scripture, I was like, okay, God. Because initially I was like, okay, is the Lord, you know, I, I really didn't tap into what the Lord was, where he was trying to lead me. But let's read this scripture. And when, as you're reading it, think about what he's trying to tell you. Would somebody please read? Jesus, I'll read. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. This is my father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Amen. Thank you, Sister Alma. So this scripture is, you know, is just one in the in the book of John, but especially that chapter 15. You know, it's I love that chapter. Um, talking about Jesus being the vine and we are the branches. And when you look at this vine and you see the branches, right? What are they? They're like intertwined, right? And then bearing and then breaking off and bearing fruit. We just went through the fruits of the spirit, right? So mm -hmm. this gives you a good picture of, of the fruit and how we all abide together on the vine with our lush grapes, right? as they grow on the vine. So he said, without him, we can do nothing. Apart from him, we can do nothing. You could not grow and bear fruit on your own. 
You can't be something spiritual on your own. You can spiritualize things. You can get involved in other spiritual things, but you can't be or bear the fruit of the spirit without the spirit of God. So it's, and it also is telling us here that it's to your God's glory that we bear much fruit, that we show ourselves to be the disciples of Jesus Christ. There is no 12 step program, no support group, no self help book, and no rehabilitation clinic that can empower us to live free from sin. The old unclean spirits are constantly, and I'm going to explain that in, in one second, constantly circling around us waiting for their chance for a hostile takeover. And those are strongholds, okay? Those strongholds are just circling around you, keeping you in, and those spirits are just waiting until you let up, let up your guard, let down, or let down your guard rather, or uh, begin to doubt. As soon as you begin to doubt, as soon as you begin to not believe, they can, they can get in there, okay, to affect you. Um, so it's important that we abide in Jesus Christ, that we be filled with his spirit in Jesus' name, overflowing, amen? Amen. So there is a solution. When we invite the builder of the house to live in the house, he brings with him the power to defeat any unclean spirit or evil influence. Acts 1.8, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, for that power. Thank you, Lord. Everybody, I'm going to get plugged in. Can everybody say that? <laughs> going to get plugged in. I'm going to get plugged <laughs> in. I, I wasn't sure if I was <laughs> muted or not. <laughs> I'm going to get plugged in. Amen. Amen. We want that power. We want that Holy Ghost power. Praise God. Matthew 28, 18. Would somebody please read? I'll read it. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Matthew Thank you, Sister Roseanne. No evil spirit is a match for the power of Jesus Christ. See, this is the flip side, right? No human flesh is able to withstand the power of, you know, Satan. Now we're flipping it. No evil spirit is a match for the power of Jesus Christ. Amen. And that's why we have to have the Holy Ghost. There is, this is the secret victorious holy living that Jesus was trying to reveal in the, to the Pharisees. Christ in you, the hope of glory. This is the secret. Having Jesus Christ dwelling within you or in your house is the hope of glory. Praise God. When the house is cleaned and filled with the holy power of God, we are protected from the enemy and our house is safe and secure. Can everybody say amen? Amen. Amen. So, so there it amen. is, our house cleaned and full of the power of the Holy Ghost. There's nothing like a Holy Ghost filled family. <laughs> Praise God. Praying together, working together, believing together, cleaning their house together. <laughs> Praise God. So now that brings us to our discussion questions. And so everybody can unmute if you want. Um, let me just look at this real quick. Well, we'll see how it goes. What was Jesus teaching the Pharisees when he spoke of the prophet Jonah and the queen of Sheba? Uh, he was basically uh, putting them to shame uh, because the, the heathens 
that had interacted with uh, God and with God's people in from the from the scriptures that they had, you know, they hadn't they they read all the times uh, were going to judge them who they felt that they were the the ones who uh, were the closest to God and had all the righteousness. Right. But they, they were hypocrites. Exactly. They were hypocrites. But also he was relating it to Jerusalem and how uh, both of these situations, you know, like with Jonah, Nineveh had repented and with the Queen of Sheba, right? Yeah. She was more noble and uh, she was the one that was married to, um, to Solomon. And the Lord was relating how these people people had repented right but jerusalem re refused to re it was jerusalem that the queen of, um hold on a second let me read it to you <laughs> i'm just really tired i'm sorry it's okay nineveh was more righteous than jerusalem because the people of nineveh repented at the preaching of jonah okay and but Jerusalem refused to repent at the preaching of someone who is even greater than Jonah. And the Queen of Sheba was more noble than Jerusalem because she recognized and acknowledged the wisdom of Solomon. But Jerusalem refused to accept the wisdom of someone who is greater than Solomon. That's right. Praise God. They wanted Remember to think highly of themselves, but. They right. did, couldn't hold a candle to these other no. heathens. No. Yeah. And Jesus was also telling them that he's the sign. That's right. And that he's, he's the one they should be looking for. Praise God. So why didn't Jesus satisfy the scribes and the Pharisees' doubts and prove to them that he was the Messiah, the Son of God? Because he wanted them to have faith in him and not through signs and wonders and all Amen. that he could do. Amen. It, he's not about and, forcing us into believing. Amen. And also, we shouldn't be looking for signs. We shouldn't be following signs either. Yeah. We pray that God would, that signs and wonders would follow us, right? But we're not following those signs. That's Praise right. God. So, we wouldn't just follow somebody because, God, you know, suddenly they're laying hands on people and mighty things are happening, you know, through their works. No, we don't follow that sort of thing. But what we do is we get a hold of God. We get a hold of the power of God. We bear fruit. We yes. become more like Jesus. We become, uh, we walk in faith and we allow the spirit of God to work through us. And then that's what, when signs will follow us. That's right. Praise God. So what does the parable of the empty house teach us about our own self-righteousness and personal works of goodness? If we think that we're so-called okay, you know, I'm spiritual, I love God, but when you check my heart out or, you know, my attitude, my reactions, if that doesn't display God, then it simply means that even though I'm professing it externally, verbally, it's not in my heart. So in effect, my heart is empty. It's, it's void, Amen. I think. I am. Amen. Amen. And it all comes from the heart. Out of the abundance of the heart is what how I'm going to react. That's Amen. right. Amen. Thank you, Sister Alma. That was a good answer. Praise God. You don't want your house to be left desolate. <laughs> you want it to be filled and righteous. So last question, why was it necessary to have the Holy Ghost dwelling within us? So that we're more, that, for that we communicate better with Jesus and God and by him dwelling in us helps us to stay 
more like Jesus and God. Amen. Uh, thank you, Lori. That was good. Um, but there's a little more to it. To come against the evil spirits because it's by the spirit of God that can only come against those things. Amen. Amen. So what you said, Lori, was good. And what Nicole, Sister Nicole just added is good because the combination is, you know, the, but the spirit of God dwelling in us gives God a place to dwell. It makes us a clean vessel, right? And it gives us the power to overcome the enemy, to fight against the evil. Praise God. So it's necessary to have the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Because the Holy Ghost is when you, you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Power to overcome evil. Power to live a godly life power to be holy in an unholy world right praise god amen so jesus is god christ in you the hope of glory amen, amen. so that's the end of our lesson for this week i pray that you all um now have a better understanding of this parable um it's so interesting to see how Jesus related, right, these stories to get his point across. And I, there's nothing like the word of God. So thank you all for being here. Thank you for listening. God bless you. I'm handing this back to Brother Alex. Thank you so much, Sister Patty. Uh, God bless each and every one of you. It's a good reminder that we are uh, beloved by the Lord. And he not only wants to be our God, he, does, he not only wants to be with us, but he wants to be in us. He wants to Amen. inhabit our hearts. Uh, he wants to have that close, intimate relationship with us to the point where we become his hands and his feet in this world. Uh, and you can't get much closer to somebody in a relationship than that, right? Amen. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, Melissa and I, you know, we, we are about as close as, as we're is we're ever going to be with anybody in this world because our hearts are together, you know, our hearts, but we, 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 even with that loving marriage relationship, we cannot even hope to match uh, the kind of relationship that, that God has within us in our hearts. And that's why it is so important to receive the gift of the Holy ghost so that we will have Christ living in us and we will be the expression of his love and his and the relationship that he wants to have not only with us but with the whole world and uh and he's not, he's not going to force anybody he's not he's never going to try to you know pressure you at all into receiving his spirit but if your heart is empty and your your mind is empty your spirit is empty it's going to be an attractive house for some somebody, and it's not always going to be somebody that you want to come into your house. Amen. Um, so if Jesus is in your house, you have no worries. No one, no evil spirit can get in. But if Jesus is, isn't in your heart, then you're a, a big target for the enemy to come in, to deceive you, to use you for his purposes. So it's very important that we understand that um, in, in the, in the spirit realm, you and I are, um, the goal for, for Christ, but also for, for the enemy and the enemy wants to grab as many of us as possible. We see that in this last days, he is yes. trying to deceive as many people as possible. Yes. So we need to be, we need to prepare our hearts, prepare ourselves, uh, to resist him. And the best way to do that is to get Jesus inside of there. Amen. Well, God bless yes, each and every one of you. Let thing, Brother Alex. Oh, yes, yeah, Sister Alma, go ahead. Uh, I just want to make mention that, you know, one of the, I, I, I want to say the most helpful and empowerment that we have in having the Holy Ghost living inside of our hearts is that regardless of what we're going through, we're not weary of living for him but when we are under pretense or we're just trying to do this on our own we become very easily worn out yeah, and amen. tired and amen. frustrated 
But when we have the Holy Ghost pumping us, just like Sister Patty showed, when you're plugged into that source, Amen. There is no way anybody, nothing can take that. That's energy, right. That's you know, right. That, that comes to give you that that force to go on, and that's you know that's beautiful and powerful that yes, the Holy Ghost can energize you like that. Yes. Amen. And, and not only that, but strengthen you. Exactly. Yeah. Praise God. Absolutely. Praise God. Absolutely. Supernatural strength. Yeah. Amen. I wouldn't That's be where it. I am today without the Holy Ghost. Strengthening me. Yeah. Yes. Amen. Praise God. Well, let's pray and ask the Lord to bless us as we separate today and uh, let his word that we receive today um, find root and, um, and grow within our hearts and our lives and bear fruit. Precious Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for this word today. 